the first poem I'm going to read, since we're in this cool space, is a, a piece about a clay painting. And I realize I should have brought um, an image of the painting, but I'm guessing if you know clay's stuff, you've seen it. And even if you don't, you've seen it. It's the famous painting called Senecio, or Old Man. It's the famous one of the yellow, bald guy with the red eyes that are slightly off kilter, and the, he looks like he's kissing, purple lips, and maybe it's jaundiced. And I only, the only thing I think you need to know about this piece um, it takes place in New York. H&H Bagels, if you guys know H&H. &H. It makes an appearance. This is called Familiar. It was because my snot was frozen. It was because you spit out little chunks of chewed up H&H &H when I made that crack about the guy behind us in line with the slack eye. It was because it was droopy and red, off kilter and in bad need of a nap. It was because he would pucker his lips every few seconds to blow a kiss to the cop on the horse. It was because I whispered to you in an accent that does not exist, permit me, might I make kiss on you, let you puff puff on my cigarette. It was because when we found ourselves in front of Clay's Senecio, you turned to me like a robot, eyes flat as a dead man's, and said, this looks just like the guy in line. I mean, that eye needs a hammock. It was because I was about to laugh that he walked up behind you. And it was because my snot, which had warmed, shut out of my nose when the laugh broke free. <laughs> and it was because you laughed so hard, it sounded like a seal barking at thousands of fish swimming down the walls of the museum. And it was because everyone stared at us that you asked me, permit me, might I borrow you a hanky? <laughs> it was because I knew he thought we were laughing at him that I said too loudly between gasps, I had no idea this painting would make me so happy. It was because when you finally saw him, also in pucker, you closed your eyes and moved away from the painting because we think things can never be more than they are. That you kissed me on my mouth, which was itself a pucker, my eyes now crossed. And it was because just then, the man said in a confused voice to someone we could not see, you know, this painting looks very familiar. <laughs> So uh, the next piece I'm going to read uh, it appears in the newest edition of Ziziva, which I just got today, and it literally just came out. I don't know if you've seen the new Ziziva, but it's just really gorgeous. Edited by Laura Kogan and um, Oscar Villalon. Um, uh, this, I've never read this piece aloud. Um, and so... Um, the, it fits in with tonight's theme of lastness because I feel like after Ziziva, Ziziva's readers read this, this will be the last thing they ever published by me. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm joking, but wait. So this is called, uh, it's a prose piece that's called Self-Portrait as Wikipedia Entry. <laughs> and um, it appears with little underlines among <laughs> certain words. And this piece, um, like most Wikipedia entries, including my own, like my own, I, there's a Wikipedia entry for me, I don't know who authored it, but it's riddled with uh, errors, <laughs> as is this one. Self portrait as Wikipedia entry. Dean Rader was born, and it's, it's so weird to read this. It's such a, <laughs> Stupid piece. Dean Rader was born in Stockton, California during the Summer of Love. His sorrow is his own. He believes in Starsteen star and Misnomer. He carries 
a toy whistle in his pocket. American by nationality, he was conceived in a fiat near the Place du Châtelet. If asked, Raider will lie and say he doesn't remember it. <laughs> but his lazy eyes and hunched back gave him away. His left pinky finger, broken from years of basketball, has never healed, which he attributes to the cesura of distance and longing. His heart, the size of a normal man's heart, has been used as a model for a forensic mannequin. As a young boy, he once carried a small package to the river, but it was the wrong address. If asked to describe the river, he quotes Van Heisenstadt, De grenzen des Wasser nicht von Erinnerung. <laughs> Raider is not the little cricket. He is not a scissors for lefty. His soul, the size of a tiny condom, slides... <laughs> slides quickly onto Time's blind spot. In 2004, he was asked about Time's blind spot, but responded only that, quote, time like a bandage is already wound and unwound, end quote. Once, as a student in college, he grew a third sideburn. <laughs> Darkness, his maquette. Darkness, his morning coffee. Raider's father studied to be a mortician, his mother was a therapist, and not surprisingly, Raider pursued both. His head, matted with crude sketches of benches, nipples, and flower petals, is roughly the size of the Place du Châtelet. Strong at math from an early age, he helped develop what has come to be known as the Osaka postulate, which proves that the square root of a syndeton is equal to the n-sphere of trespass, skin spark, and elegy. As for his own spiritual beliefs, Rader is silent. Though one of his recent poems, entitled The Last Day of 34, suggests an influence of Simone Weil. Quote, Community is work. For all I know, God may be in both. For all you know, God may be both. And Luigi Sacramon. Quote, We want so much. We only believe in what we ask for. End quote. Considered neither the lip blister nor the noodle wrench, Raider has emerged, at least somewhat, as the repetitio rerum. In more recent work, he denies this, though indirectly, citing instead his commitment to interlocutory boundaries, bornage, through what he calls the phatic interstice. At present, his voice, the pitch and timbre of a young girl's, asks only for tang. <laughs> Consumed by his charity work with the NGO, our uncle of instrumentality, he has stopped writing entirely. When questioned about this at a 2007 fundraiser, Raider quipped, let my words say what I cannot. <laughs> Since then, a fragment of an unpublished poem attributed to Raider has started appearing on the internet. Quote, line up and line out says the moon whittle. Loss is the ring on our finger, the bright gem compassing every step as we drop down. Believe in what you know, and you'll go blind. <laughs> Experts doubt its authenticity. <laughs> to you about that home ec teacher. She meant nothing to me. And I need to come clean about the trapeze artist, the pool boy, your blank. What was I thinking? <laughs> I hope you realize that I have forgiven you for pushing me into the blank of that classic scholar. She's ancient history. That's a little joke, but I'm not joking about how blank I feel. And your cousin Sophie, Really? <laughs> My mistake. <laughs> and about the poem reader, all she did was blank my hand. Honest. But when she traced the creases, the narrow blank on the map of the future world, she made me think. I want to know you the way she knows these lines. I want you to blank me 
the way she knows how to lie. You were tempted not to clap at that one. Uh, who can blame you? Um, all right, and so the this poem is the last poem I wrote in the book, and uh, I'll close with it. I think the only thing you need to know is again a kind of prose poem or prose piece. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna explain anything. You guys will know all this stuff. It's literary, it's got a lot of literary tones in it, but you're here at a reading, you get this stuff. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. It's a busy time of year, you could be doing anything, and you're here uh, listening to people read, which is great. So thank you very much, and thanks to Peg, everyone for putting this together, this is really great. This is called The Poem You Ordered. Once upon a time, you ordered a poem. You were considering throw pillows, a new ferret, or a hatchet. <laughs> but a poem had been on your mind for months. You were finally ready to pull the trigger. As for the details, you were certain what you wanted. Something longer than a hammer, simpler than Sudoku. On the pull-down menu, you selected quatrains. But then, after much deliberation, you changed your order to couplets. You paid extra for the stirrups, the tattoo, but said no to the eye patch, the hammock, and all warranties. You were tempted to ask for rhyme. It was included. But in the end, you declined. For you, it was all about story. You worried rhymes would detract from the poems flow. If it contained people, all the better. You preferred a tailor, the Russian woman from the bakery down the street, and your, grand and your grandfather on your mother's side. But, you said to yourself, who gets everything? As for the title, you chose the option, surprise me. Most of all, you thought the poem would have to be about mercy, which would, of course, encompass loss. It must address war, and it must be open to closure. You didn't need controlling metaphor, and you had no interest in splurging for metonymy. There is no anticipation like waiting for the poem you ordered to arrive. When the poem you ordered ambled up the walk, you were caught off guard by the limp, but nothing else. Not its body cleaved in two, not the cowlick, not the delicate accretion of its form. You ask for this poem because for you, beginnings are never enough. It has always been about the ending. To the window foggy with your breath, you admit that you were never actually surprised by the limp. You knew the gun in the poem's pocket was loaded, and you knew where it was going. You had, after all, ticked the box marked bullet. 